Thank you, Bobby. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that this sermon series that we've been in, Skeletons in the Closet, has been a hard series. We've cover, covered difficult topics, topics that we normally ignore in our lives and especially in the church. We don't like talking about generational curses, which are family dysfunction, okay, that we hand down to our children, our grandchildren. And over the course of the series, we've talked about things in the past that have affected us in the present and will continue to affect our children if we don't deal with them. It's not popular to talk about sex in church, but immorality is an issue in the world. And the abuse people suffer at the hands of those who are depraved in their mind is real. We've talked about abuse and what it means to be a victim, and the pain, and the guilt, and the heartache, the feeling of unworthiness, the feeling of being not wanted. We've talked about that. We also talked about the abusers and how their only hope is that God would intervene and change their lives. We've talked about a lot of things that are hard, and today's topic is no different, because the moment you start talking about addiction, you have to also talk about all the ramifications and consequences in the lives of those who are addicted. And there's a lot of it. And every one of us has had to deal with someone who had an addiction or we've suffered from addiction ourselves. And we know, looking back in our own lives, the history, the pain it caused. So let me start by giving you some stats, okay, some, some just black and white numbers. Today in America, there are 37 million people addicted to drugs or alcohol, 37 million, okay? That's roughly a little bit over 13% of our population. That means that one out of every 13 people you encounter is a person with an addiction. That's a lot. And less than 10% will ever receive treatment, less than 10%. Addictions cost our society over $700 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars a year. And here's the kicker. A little bit over 100,000, actually 107,000 and a few more, individuals in our country died of drug overdoses in the year 2023. 107,000 plus died of drug overdoses in the last year. There is great cost to addictions. And if you ever had to deal with it in your life or in your family, you know that it is costly in more ways than money could ever count. Now, you know that one of the most popular drugs that you hear about in the news right now out there is fentanyl, right? It's dangerous. It takes just a little bit to get high and a little bit more, and you're OD'd and you die. It's a dangerous drug. Now, a few years ago, when meth first came on the scene, I was made aware of how dangerous it was because of, you know, it's not any more dangerous in that sense than other drugs, but the difference with meth is the first hit you take, it changes your brain chemistry permanently. But the truth is that every drug changes your brain chemistry. The only difference is some of them, it will revert, your brain will revert back over time. Meth's one that doesn't. So we understand the dangers of drugs. And we understand that when someone is an addict, because their brain chemistry has changed, they're not thinking clearly. You ever known a young person on drugs? They will lie, cheat, and steal, because all they can focus on is getting their next fix. They can't keep a job. They can't work because the drug controls their life. And the result is that every relationship is damaged and there's a whole huge amount of destruction in the wake of someone who suffers from an addiction. I mean, think about it. Friends, if they're not addicted, get tired of it and they turn away and walk away and who can blame them? Family doesn't usually walk away, but family lives with a heartache. It's not just the money they pour into their family member trying to help them. Usually it's your kids. 
but it's the, the, the hopes and the dreams that are shattered. The time is put in to rescue them and bail them out over and over and over again. And all the time, what is the kid, the person thinking about? How can I get my next fix? Because that's all that matters. Because it consumes their lives. And even when people go into treatment, if they're lucky enough to be one of the 10% that make it into a treatment program, it's estimated that 40 to 60% of those who enter into treatment relapse. And the downward spiral of destruction begins all over again. Now, there are reasons why people end up addicted, why addictions are so common in our nation. And we don't like it because it's too honest. The first is our family. When a young person grows up, seeing someone get drunk, just get plastered all the time, are getting high or stoned day after day after day, that young person as they grow up is going to make one of two choices. They're going to see what that addiction has caused, and they're going to run from that lifestyle as quickly as they can. Or he or she will look at their childhood, how they grew up, all they experienced, seeing mom you know, stoned or dad drunk and throwing up, whatever it was, and they will see that as normal. And it is amazing what can become somebody's normal. And because it is normal, a normal way of life for them, they'll wash right into that lifestyle. So our family of origin, our generational curses play into people becoming addicted because they see it and they experience it all their life. Now, parents, you are supposed to protect your kids. Grandparents, you have a role in that too. We protect them. We want to do what's best for them. Sometimes a little bit overkill. You ever try to buckle a child in a current car seat? It's like a medieval torture chamber you know, device. You can't hardly get them in it. We want them to be safe. When I was a kid, 12 immunizations. Now there's over 60, which is, in my estimation, detrimental to the kids. Okay? We, are, we want to protect our kids. But do you understand, parents and grandparents, that your children's friends have more influence over their choices on a daily basis than you do? The friends your kids hang around with have more influence in their life than you do as a parent or grandparent. And if you allow them to have any friend they want, and the friends they have are drinking or doing drugs, I promise you, your children are going to drink and do drugs. So family of origin and friends, peer pressure, are the two main reasons why we have addicts in our nation. We've let it happen. We've let it happen by turning a blind eye and hoping and praying it'll just get better on its own. Now, we know that the drugs themselves, many of them aren't evil. Fentanyl has a great medical use. It's used by surgeons all the time. In the proper hands, it's beneficial. In the wrong hands, it's deadly. The opioids, the pills... They're great if you've had surgery as a painkiller or if you've, you know, had an accident and you're hurt, but you misuse them, they can end your life. Even marijuana, even marijuana has been proven to curb the side effects of some diseases and treatments, and it has a beneficial use. The point is, these things in and of themselves are not bad. God has given them to us to use for a good purpose. But like so many things, what God gives us to use for good, the devil takes and perverts and uses it for evil. And it is when it becomes evil that it becomes a trap. That's what an addiction is. You are trapped in something you cannot get out of. Years ago, in time long before we all were born, the Eskimos had a way of dealing with a wolf that was harassing their village. Now, oh, it's a weird story. But a wolf that was harassing the village, the Eskimos had a way of getting rid of it. They'd take an extremely sharp 
knife, razor edge. They would dip it in animal blood and set it outside in the cold to freeze. Then they would dip it in more animal blood and let it freeze again, and more and freeze and more and freeze until they had basically a blood popsicle on a knife. And they would bury the handle of the knife in the ground with the blade sticking up. So when the wolf came to harass the village, it would smell the blood and go to the knife and begin to lick one of the blood. And it would lick and lick and lick and lick and lick like we would a popsicle, right? Until the point came that the blood had been licked away, but the wolf's tongue was so cold it didn't realize it was slicing its own tongue on the knife. And it kept licking the blood and licking the blood until it didn't even realize he was licking his own blood until he eventually damaged his mouth so much he would bleed to death. And they were rid of the wolf. See, that's what an addiction is like. We start out saying, I'm in control. I can handle it. I can do it. Then all of a sudden we find out we're not in control. We can't handle it anymore. The addiction has taken control. That's what an addiction does. We start by believing we can handle it on our own, and we end up trapped and headed toward death. You ever talk to an addict? What do they say? Some of you know. I can't handle it. I got to have it. Life's too hard without it. I can't quit anyway. I need it. I need it to get by because life's too hard. You heard those things before? I've heard them. Why? Because the addiction itself has taken control. But in that, you're hearing I, 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 I. There's a whole lot of I's and all that. I need it. I can't handle life without it. Life's too hard. I've got to have it to survive. There's a whole lot of focus on self. And that's what addiction does. It focuses the person on themselves and what they want, irregardless of the consequences to anyone else. The addict says, I can't. And you know why that's true? They can't. The drug addict can't kick the drugs. The alcoholic can't kick the alcohol. And it's not just those. Someone who has an addiction to food, which the Bible calls gluttony, can't just get over it. Someone who's addicted to pornography, which the, pornography, which the Bible calls immorality, can't just stop. An addiction is an addiction, whatever it is. It is taking control of of your life. You can't just walk away from something that controls who you are. You need help. You need help. And there's only one who can help. So when you hear someone saying, I can't handle life without it. I need it. It's the way I am. I just have to have it. When they're all the focus is on themselves, and especially when they say, Life hasn't been fair. This isn't right. I shouldn't have to live this way. I should get what I want. You know what my message to that person is? You know what my message to you is? Message to the people online? Suck it up, buttercup. Life's not going to get any easier. This world is sinful and broken, and it is difficult and hard at its best. And you have two choices. You can either succumb to it and choose your addiction whatever you want to lead you to the grave and numb yourself to get by, or you can rise above the fray, see the world for what it really is, and focus your life on the one who can help you, because there's only one who can help you overcome the challenges in your life, the difficulties in this world, and even the addictions you suffer from. There's only one you can turn to for real, absolute help. We were never intended to live this life with a focus on I, on self. You understand that? That was the devil's problem. Do you hear the first reading? Isaiah 14 is talking about the devil. And he says some interesting things. It's the devil's words. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, who are defeated, have defeated the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Five times the devil says, I'm going to be something. See, his focus was on himself, and that's all he cared about. You know, that's still who he is. 
He doesn't care about anything or anyone but himself. He just wants to satisfy his own desires. And what does an addiction do but put a person in a situation where they want to satisfy their own desires at the cost of everyone and everything else? And the moment you put your focus on yourself, you're destined for destruction. Doesn't matter if you're addicted to alcohol or addicted to power. Destruction is still the end result. And think about it. What's the first thing Noah did when he got off the ark? Planted a vineyard, made some wine, got drunk. What happened? One of his sons was cursed because of that. Do you want me to be cursed by God? Okay. Lot got drunk. And his family suffered because of it. And I would say, if you look at the history, the entire world suffered because of Lot's drunkenness. Okay. Amnon was addicted to immorality. He wanted what he wanted no matter what. It caused him to rape his sister. You know when he died? At a party, snot-faced drunk when his brother executed him in front of the rest of his siblings. Okay. By all accounts, Queen Vashti was beautiful, one of the most beautiful women in the kingdom. But King Xerxes was drunk when he banished her. And in that culture, when a decree was given, it could not be reversed. She was out the door and gone because he was drunk. You see, when you let something take hold of you, the consequences are deadly. John wrote this. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. What's he saying? The world is going to offer to you what you want. It's going to tater, cater to your flesh. It's going to cater to what you see, what you desire. It's going to offer you everything for you. And the moment you indulge, it has you what addiction does. It offers you the world and puts you in bondage. It was the Apostle Paul who in the reading that Bobby read set the contrast between what it's like in the world and who we are supposed to be as the people of God. Listen to part of that text. So then let's not sleep as others do, but let's be alert and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We are called by God to live our lives as those who rise above what this world offers and see clearly what is true and right and what is not. And the only way we can understand that is to follow what God has revealed to us. People who, who out here are living in darkness, it doesn't mean it's dark. It means that their minds are polluted. They can't see or think clearly. They look at a polluted, perverted world and think it's normal. And God show, has shown us a different way of life. He's helped us to lift our heads above that and see what is true, what is good. How to live our lives in light of who we are as those whom he places value upon. A very, very wise person, and I wish we could get our young people to understand this. A very wise person said this, before we set our hearts on too much of anything, let us examine how happy are those who already possess it. Hear it. Before we set our hearts too much on anything, let us examine how happy are those who already possess it. The young people you know, or even maybe in your own life, before you go down the path of drugs or alcohol, look at those who've gone down that path. Is their life good? Are they enjoying life? Are they, has it been for their betterment? Are they living a fulfilled, blessed life? And if not, do you really want what they have? All we have to do is look around us and we can see the consequences of the choices that we're being offered. If it's, a, if it's any addiction, you want somebody other than your wife? You want to go down that road? Do you see the consequences? You want to go out and party all night? Spend more money than you make? Run up credit card debts? Because you got to have, you got to have, you want, you want, you want. It's all about you. 
When's the last time you knew someone who declared bankruptcy and came out on the other side smelling like a rose? It's not fun. There's all kinds of addictions. And they all bring destruction in their wake. What is it we really want? What is it we would tell our young people? When you're making choices in your life, what do you really want in your life? Do you even know what's good? Do you even know what's worthwhile to possess? So many people want money. Money, money, money. They're addicted to the idea of having more and more money. You know what? Having peace in your heart and peace in your family is worth more than all the money in the world. You understand that? To, to have people around you that you can trust and people look at you as someone they can trust is priceless. Money can't buy that. To, to be able to, to live your life with the assurance that I'm here for a purpose and I'm co- accomplishing something good energizes you to move forward in life. The world offers a quick fix, an immediate high, and a lifetime of misery and heartache. God does the opposite. You realize that. God offers a painful fix, but it results in absolute joy, a life of hard work, and in the end, eternity. Now, let me explain that, okay? The world's quick fix, get high, have a party, put off to forever what you need to do today. Just party hardy and move on and let the consequences fall where they will. God offers a painful fix. Die to yourself, take your eyes off yourself, and learn what it means to live for others. It's not easy. It's abnormal in this world. You are created by God for more than simply living for the momentary pleasures this world has to offer. The world's immediate high, you feel good for a moment, then you suffer the hangover or the withdrawals when you wake up. God's absolute joy is an ongoing high that never ends. It's a feel-good trip that will last for a lifetime. And the reason is that we have purpose in our lives and we understand that we have meaning and that we are of value and God desires to use us for something greater than ourselves. Where the addict has learned to live for the moment and put off tomorrow, the Christian lives with an understanding of tomorrow and finds the greatest joy in every moment we experience in life. Because God has revealed to us that there's more to who we are than this moment. There's something greater he has in store for us. But until that happens, this moment has meaning and purpose for us. But the addict has learned that life is full of pain and misery because that's all they have to experience. The child of God is given purpose. We have a job to do. You know what the job is? We are living representatives of our God in this world. We are here for the purpose of making our Savior, Jesus, known in a world that doesn't know Him and in many cases doesn't want Him, but He's the only one that can help them in the miserable circumstances of their lives. He's the only one that can change them. Where so many people are focused on the I thing, what I want, what I need, I can't live without it, I've got to have it. Christian is led to understand there's more to life than me. And the greatest joy that I find is when I give of myself to others. Where the devil would try to convince us that's all about the momentary pleasures, what has God revealed to us? God says it's all about you. God says, I will sacrifice everything for you. God doesn't say it's about me. God says it's about you. Why did Jesus come and die on the cross? Because it was to his benefit? He suffered. He agonized. He died. That wasn't for his good. He wasn't serving self. He was giving of himself. He was serving you. He was giving of himself that you might be blessed. 
And it's as we live as his representatives in this world, we live as he lived. We give of ourselves to bless others. And in the end, we find what? (laughs) That all the blessings come back. Because in the end, what did Jesus receive? His kingdom, us. And in the end, what do we receive in serving him? But the blessings of knowing that our life has meaning and purpose and we will spend eternity celebrating who our God is. Jesus did not only die to win for us the forgiveness of our sins, he he also rose and lives that we might be empowered to live differently today than we were before we knew him. That's what the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus means, that we are not who we were. This world no longer can hold us in bondage. We have been set free, free from the things that would captivate us, free from the things that would drag us away from God, free from the things that would bring destruction. We have been set free to live, to live for God, and to live our lives giving of, giving of ourselves to others. May we celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, and the life everlasting, depart in peace. Amen.